and welcome to the Lazy Book Club podcast, the book club for those who don't want to read or leave the house. My name is Matt Gonzalez. My name is David Cox. And I'm Josh Matheson. And this week we are on chapter two of Peter Pan, which is The Shadow. The Shadow, it's called The Shadow, yeah. So where we left off last week, we were introduced to the Darlings and their very weird house set up with Nana the dog and they have kids and then decide whether they can keep them after they've had them rather than trying to decide if they can afford them before they have them. I see how much broccoli they had or something. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) How many cauliflowers they have in the bank. And we finished off the chapter with the arrival of Peter Pan. Yeah. With the difference of the fact that Mrs. Darling was actually in the room when he appeared. She was in the room when it happened. Yeah, which is... Well, <laughs> it's a Hamilton reference. In the room. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't pick that. up on that, Matt. I didn't know. Yeah. I was stupidly talking. Yeah. No, I was <laughs> in the room where it happened. Copyright. Right, so we jump in. Let's go for it. Chapter two The Shadow. Mrs. Darling screamed, and as if in answer to a bell, the door opened, and Nana entered. Returned from her evening out. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Please don't. <laughs> She's absolutely hammered. <laughs> well, <laughs> Wendy. Shh. She's slurring and dribbling all over the place. That would be great. I would love that. She's got a kebab. Right. <laughs> <laughs> She's got mayonnaise all down her front. <laughs> I was going to be like naughty and say she's brought someone home with her. <laughs> she's, she's got the tramp from Lady in the Tramp in turn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> She growled and sprang at the boy, who leapt lightly through the window. Again, Mrs. Darling screamed, this time in distress for him, for she thought he was killed, and she ran down into the street to look for his little body, but it was not there. And she looked up, and in the black night she could see nothing but what she thought was a shooting star. She returned to the nursery and found Nana with something in her mouth, which proved to be the boy's shadow. As he leapt at the window, Nana had closed it quickly, too late to catch him, but his shadow had not had time to get out. Slam went the window and snapped it off. You may be sure Mrs. Darling examined the shadow carefully, but it was quite the ordinary kind. Well, not, because it's it's there when the the object that's casting it isn't there, so it can't be the ordinary well, kind of shadow. It seems to be the, well, the kind of thing where we're just expected to accept that this is normal in, in this world. You've got an absence I don't know. of light in your mouth. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Nana had no doubt of what the best thing to do with his shadow. She hung it out of the window, meaning he is sure to come back for it. Let us put it where he can get it easily without disturbing the children. But, unfortunately, Mrs. Darling could not leave it hanging out at the window. It looked so like the washing and lowered the whole tone of the house. (laughs) Always keeping up with the joke. I know. On a dirty shadow hanging out the window. So worried about their neighbours. This is, again, a deviation from the Disney film, because I think the shadow was animated in the Disney film, wasn't it? I mean, I'm not mean animated as in cartoon. I mean, animated as in it moved. And it, it was mischievous, and it, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. exactly. Whereas this seems to be almost like an item of clothing. Like, it's just like this a floppy. Yeah, left, you know? exactly. Because yeah. if she's just hung it out and it's not flown away or run away or doing anything, it's obviously just like almost like a garment. She thought of showing it to Mr. Darling, but he was totting up winter greatcoats for John and Michael with a wet towel around his head to keep his brain clear. <laughs> and, it, and it seemed a shame to trouble him. But besides, she knew exactly what he would say. It all comes of having a dog for a nurse. <laughs> she decided to roll the shadow up and put it away carefully in a drawer until a fitting opportunity came for telling her husband. Ah, me. The opportunity came a week later, on that never-to-be-forgotten Friday. Of course, it was a Friday. I ought to have been especially careful on a Friday, she used to say afterwards to her husband, while perhaps Nana was on the other side of her, holding her hand. (laughs) I love Nana. No, no, Mr Darling always said. I am responsible for it all. I, George Darling, did it. Mia culpa, mia culpa. He had had a classical education. I don't know what mea culpa means. It's Latin, isn't it? Mea culpa means it's my fault. 
Oh, I'm culprit. Mm. Right, yeah. That's what it means. Yeah, I am. I am at fault. They sat thus night after night, recalling that fatal Friday, till every detail of it was stamped on their brains and came through on the other side, like the faces on a bad coinage. If only I'd not accepted that invitation to dine at twenty-seven, Mrs. Darling said. If only I had not pulled me medicine into Nana's bowl, said Mr. Darling. If only I had pretended to like the medicine, was what Nana's wet... Oh, wait, that was Nana, but not Nana. It was a thought. I'll just say it. Mm, is Nana also... <laughs> I don't know, what do you think? Is it going to be a feature throughout? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think, think so. Feature. I have a feeling that she's not going to have a, a constant I'll just voice. do it as a thought, so in narrative... You just do it in a like. scooby D voice. <laughs> 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 I won't do it. I don't know why Scooby Doo because you never know oh, about yeah, Pinocchio or something. Like yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> Jane Eyre. <laughs> Jane Eyre. <laughs> Let's save it for Jane Eyre. All right. <laughs> if only I had pretended to like the medicine, was what Nana's wet eyes said. My liking for parties, George. My fateful gift of humour, dearest. My touch about trifles, dear master and mistress. Then one or more of them would break down altogether. Nana, at the thought, It's true, it's true, they ought not to have had a dog for a nurse. Many a time it was Mr Darling who put the handkerchief to Nana's eyes. That fiend! Mr Darling would cry, and Nana's bark was the echo of it. But Mrs Darling never upbraided Peter. There was something in the right-hand corner of her mouth that wanted not to call Peter names. That's the childish nature. Cheeky, cheeky kiss. It's a yeah. cheeky kiss. They would sit there in the empty nursery, recalling fondly every smallest detail of that dreadful evening. It had begun so uneventfully, so precisely like a hundred other evenings, with Nana putting on the water for Michael's bath and carrying him to it on her back. I won't ever go to bed, he'd shouted, like one who still believed that he had the last word on the subject. I won't, I won't. Nana, it isn't six o'clock yet. Oh dear, oh dear, I shan't love you any more, Nana. I tell you, I won't be bathed. I won't, I won't. Then Mrs Darling had come in, wearing her white evening gown. She had dressed early because Wendy so loved to see her in her evening gown, with the necklace George had given her. She was wearing Wendy's bracelet on her arm. She had asked for the loan of it. Wendy loved to lend her bracelet to her mother. She had found her two older children playing at being herself and father on the occasion of Wendy's birth, and John was saying, I am happy to inform you, Mrs Darling, that you are now a mother, in just such a tone as Mr Darling himself may have used on the real occasion. Wendy had danced with joy, just as the real Mrs Darling must have done. What, when she just gave birth? Apparently. An odd game to play as a kid. Let's play uh, you being born, and you're going to play your mum with you being born. Yeah. Then John was born, with the extra pomp that he conceived due to the birth of a male, and Michael came from his bath to ask to be born also, but John said brutally that they did not want any more. Oh! <laughs> wow! <laughs> right. You're adopted. <laughs> <laughs> you're not welcome. Michael had nearly cried. Nobody wants me, he said. And of course, the lady in the evening dress could not stand that. I do, she said. I so want a third child. Boy or girl? asked Michael, not too hopefully. Boy. Then he had leapt into her arms. Such a little thing for Mr and Mrs Darling and Nana to recall now but not so little if that was to be Michael's last night in the nursery. They go on with their recollections. It was then that I rushed in like a tornado, wasn't it? Mr Darling would say, scorning himself. And indeed he had been like a tornado. Perhaps there was some excuse for him. He too had been dressed for the party, and all had gone well with him until he came to his tie. It is an astounding thing to have to tell, but this man, though he knew about stocks and chairs, had no real mastery of his tie. Sometimes the thing yielded to him without a contest, 
but there were occasions when it would have been better for the house if he had swallowed his prize and used a made-up tie. This was such an occasion, he came rushing into the nursery with a crumpled little brute of a tie in his hand. "'Why, what's the matter, father dear?' "'Matter?' he yelled. He really yelled. "'This tie, it will not tie!' He became dangerously sarcastic. "'Not round my neck, round the bedpost. "'Oh, yes, twenty times I've made it up round the bedpost, "'but round my neck, no! Oh, dear, no! "'Begs to be excused!' He thought Mrs. Darling was not sufficiently impressed, and he went on sternly. I warn you of this, mother, that unless this tie is round my neck, we won't go out to dinner tonight, and if I don't go out to dinner tonight, I never go to the office again, and if I don't go to the office again, you and I starve, and our children will be flung out into the streets. He's such a flapper, isn't he? (laughs) My word. There's a definite drama queen in this family, and it's him. Well, yeah. Even then, Mrs. Darling was placid. Let me try, dear, she said. And indeed, that was what he had come to ask her to do. And with her nice, cool hands, she tied his tie for him, while the children stood around to see their fate decided. Some men would have resented her being able to do it so easily, but Mr. Darling had far too fine a nature for that. He thanked her carelessly, at once forgot his rage, and in another moment was dancing around the room with Michael on his back. "'How wildly we romped,' said Mrs. Darling, recalling it. (laughs) That has a different context. (laughs) Everything has innuendo, but but that's quite less a bit more. Why don't you just go, oh, can you help me with my bow tie? Not go, like, Lily loses the plot. I know, I find it really funny how he's like, oh, most men wouldn't, would would despise the fact that, you know, their wife could do that. And I'm like, well, he's obviously not completely comfortable with it because he never actually asked her for help. Do you know what I mean? He's like, I've gone in, I'm just going to go in and make a scene to the point where she offers because I don't want to, I don't know, appear weak and actually ask her outrightly if she can just help me with it. There seems to be some fragile masculinity here. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Our last romp, Mr. Darling groaned. Oh, George. Oh, I thought that was rem- the groan. <laughs> 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 it was not. It was me trying to make sense of who is speaking. Oh, George, do you remember Michael suddenly said to me, how did you get to know me, mother? I remember. They were rather sweet, don't you think, George? And they were ours. Ours. And now they're gone. The romp had ended with the appearance of Nana, and most unluckily Mr. Darling collided against her, covering his trousers with hairs. They were not only new trousers, but they were the first he had ever had with braid on them, and he had had to bite his lip to prevent the tears coming. Of course, Mrs. Darling brushed him, but he began to talk again about its being a mistake to have a dog for a nurse. George, Nana is a treasure. No doubt, but I have an uneasy feeling at times that she looks upon the children as puppies. Oh no, dear one, I feel feel sure she knows they have souls. Oh wow, to say that in front of Nana, you have no soul. I wonder, Mr Darling said thoughtfully, I wonder. It was an opportunity, his wife felt, for telling him about the boy. At first, he poo-pooed the story, hey. but he became <laughs> hey poo-poo. <laughs> but he became thoughtful when she showed him the shadow. It is nobody I know, he said, examining it carefully. But it does look like a scoundrel. We were still discussing it, you remember, said Mister Darling, when Nana came in with Michael's medicine. You will never carry the bottle in your mouth again, Nana, and it's all my fault. Strong man though he was, there is no doubt that he had behaved rather foolishly over the medicine. If he had a weakness, it was for thinking that all his life he had taken medicine boldly, and so now, when Michael dodged the spoon in Nana's mouth, he said reprovingly, Be a man, Michael. Won't! Won't! Michael cried naughtily. Mrs. Darling left the room to get a chocolate for him, and Mr. Darling thought this showed want of firmness. Mother, don't pamper him, he called after her. Michael, when I was your age, I took medicine without a murmur. I said, thank you, kind parents, for giving me bottles that make me well. 
That's such a lie. It's <laughs> such a parent lie, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I never did that when I was your age. Of course you did. <laughs> he really thought this was true. And Wendy, who is now in her nightgown, believed it also. And she said to encourage Michael, That medicine you sometimes take, father, is much nastier, isn't it? Ever so much nastier, Mr. Darling said bravely. And I would take it now as an example to you, Michael, if I hadn't lost the bottle. He had not exactly lost it. He had climbed in the dead of night to the top of the wardrobe and hidden it there. (laughs) What he did not know was that the faithful Liza had found it and put it back on his washstand. I know where it is, father, Wendy cried, always to be glad of service. I'll bring it. And she was off before he could stop her. Immediately, his spirit sank in the strangest way. John, he said, shuddering. It's most beastly stuff. It's that nasty, sticky, sweet kind. It will soon be over, father, John said cheerily. And then in rushed Wendy with the medicine in a glass. I've been as quick as I could, she panted. You have been wonderfully quick, her father retorted with a vindictive politeness that was quite (laughs) thrown away upon her. (laughs) Michael first, he said doggedly. Father first said Michael, who was of a suspicious nature. This kid is not stupid. (laughs) You do it, then I'll do it. I shall be sick, you know, Mr. Darling said threateningly. Come on, father, said John. Hold your tongue, John, his father rapped out. Wendy was quite puzzled. I thought you took it quite easily, father. That is not the point, he retorted. The point is that there is more in my glass than in Michael's spoon. And it isn't fair. I would say it as though it were my last breath. It isn't fair. Father, I'm waiting, said Michael coldly. (laughs) It's all very well to say you're waiting, so am I waiting. Father's a cowardly custard. (laughs) So are you a cowardly custard. So got his number. <laughs> I love how this dad's like arguing with his kid, like, yeah. you know, oh, that's not fair. You've got less than me. It's like, that's how old kids. are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's really weird. So are you a cowardly custard? I'm not frightened. Neither am I frightened. Well, then take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you take it. Wendy had a splendid idea. Why not both take it at the same time? Certainly, said Mr. <laughs> Darling. Are you ready, Michael? Is it like tequila? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Salt. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the salt and the lemon? Yeah. <laughs> Wendy gave the words, one, two, three, and Michael took his medicine, but Mr. Darling slipped his behind his back. There was a yell of rage from Michael and, Oh, father! Wendy exclaimed. <laughs> I thought that might have gone in a different direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Funny>. <laughs> just Michael's just got like sailor language. And he's three. <laughs> what do you mean by oh, father? Mr. Darling demanded. Stop that row, Michael. I meant to take mine, but I, I missed it. Look here, all of you, he said entreatingly as soon as Nana had gone into the bathroom. I've just thought of a splendid joke. I shall pour my medicine into Nana's bowl and she will drink it thinking it's milk. It was the colour of milk, but the children did not have... I don't fancy taking something in the colour of milk that's a medicine. This is reminding me of the time when I had chicken pox and my mum went to the doctors and got me medicine and she went into the school to pick up my homework and I was like, oh, I may as well take some now. So I took a sip and it it was chamomile lotion and you meant to rub Um, it in. No. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I've been drinking it. Is that? Is, is that she was just looking at me like you idiot. <laughs> is that even safe? I don't know. I'm still alive, aren't I? I'm yeah, still you're here. still here. It's Apparently fine. unscathed. Who knows? <laughs> it was the colour of milk, but the children did not have their father's sense of humour, and they looked at him reproachfully as he poured the medicine into Nana's bowl. What fun! he said doubtfully, and they did not dare expose him when Mrs. Darling and Nana returned. Nana, good dog, he said, patting her. I've put a little milk in your bowl, Nana. Nana wagged her tail, ran to the medicine and began lapping it. Then she gave Mr. Darling such a look. (laughs) (laughs) The shade of it all. (laughs) Then she gave Mr. Darling such a look 
Not an angry look, she showed him the great red tear that makes us so sorry for noble dogs, and crept into her kennel. Mr. Darling was frightfully ashamed of himself, but he would not give in. In a horrid silence, Mrs. Darling smelt the bowl. Oh, George, she said, it's your medicine. It was only a joke, he roared while she comforted her boys, and Wendy hugged Nana. Much good, he said bitterly, my wearing myself to the bone trying to be funny in this house. And still Wendy hugged Nana. That's right, he shouted. Coddler, nobody coddles me. Oh dear no, I am the only breadwinner. Why, I should be coddled. Ugh. Why? George, Mrs. Darling entreated him. Not so loud, the servants will hear ya. Somehow, they had got into the way of calling Liza the servants. Yeah, I love how they're pretending there's multiple when there's one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let them, he answered. Let re- them. Re- <laughs> Let them, he answered recklessly. Bring in the old world, but I refuse to allow that dog to lord it in my nursery for an hour longer. The children wept and Nana ran to him beseechingly, but he waved her back. He felt he was a strong man again. Uh. In vain, in vain, he cried. The proper place for you is in the yard. And there you go to be tied up this instant. I really don't like this guy. George, George, Mrs. Darling whispered. Remember what I told you about that boy? Alas, he would not listen. He was determined to show who was master in that house, and when commands would not draw Nana from the kennel, he lured her out of it with honeyed words, and seizing her roughly, dragged her from the nursery. He was ashamed of himself, and yet he did it. It was all owing to his too affectionate nature, which craved for admiration. But is it affectionate nature? I don't feel like that's affectionate nature at all. I feel like that's just fragility in his own character and his own self-worth. Yeah, but I like the fact that it's been mentioned a couple of times. Oh, he's nice, really. He's always affectionate. He's not like other men. But really, yeah, but it's he, like he's, he's trying to convince himself or the author's trying to convince us yeah. that he's a nice guy when he clearly isn't. It's weird when an author does that. It's like, you present him as you present him. No, he's quite nice. It's like, well, you have to write him doing like yeah, you have to. Yeah, his actions speak otherwise. When he had tied her up in the backyard, the wretched father went and sat in the passage with his knuckles to his eyes. In the meantime, Mrs. Darling had put the children to bed in unwanted silence and lit their night lights. They could hear Nana barking and John whimpered, Is it because he's chaining her up in the yard? But Wendy was wiser. That is not Nana's unhappy bark, she said, little guessing what was about to happen. That's her bark when she smells danger. Danger? Are you sure, Wendy? Oh, yes. Mrs. Darling quivered and went to the window. It was securely fastened. She looked out and the night was peppered with stars. They were crowding round the house, as if curious to see what was to take place there, but she did not notice this, nor that one or two of the smaller ones winked at her. Yet a nameless fear clutched at her heart and made her cry. Oh, how I wish I wasn't going to a party tonight. Even Michael, already half asleep, knew that she was perturbed, and he asked, Can anything harm us, mother, after the night lights are lit? Nothing, precious, she said. They are the eyes a mother leaves behind her to guard her children. She went from bed to bed, singing enchantments over them, and little Michael flung his arms round her. Mother, he cried. I'm glad of you. They were the last words she said to him for a long time. Number 27 was only a few yards distant, but there had been a slight fall of snow, and father and mother darling picked their way over it deftly, not to soil their shoes. They were already the only persons in the street, and all the stars were watching them. Stars are beautiful, but they may not take an active part in anything. They must just look on forever. It is a punishment put on them for something they did so long ago that no star knows what it is. Wow, way to make stars bleak. I know, right? <laughs> they're all being punished. Yeah. Like, Lion King's like, they're the kings of the past who watch over us. Bunch of criminals, a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a thief. That one's a murderer. Yeah, exactly. So the older ones have become glassy-eyed and seldom speak, 
Winking is the star language. But the little ones still wonder. They are not really friendly to Peter, who had a mischievous way of stealing up behind them and trying to blow them out. But they are so fond of fun that they were on his side tonight and anxious to get the grown-ups out of the way. So as soon as the door of number 27 closed on Mr and Mrs Darling, there was a commotion in the firmament, and the smallest of all the stars in the Milky Way screamed out. Technically, this, this star has got a voice. Do you, <laughs> I don't know how you want me to... <laughs> it doesn't say much. It's literally two it words. The highest voice you can possibly yeah. <laughs> And the smallest of all the stars in the Milky Way screamed out, That's quite right, though. That's probably what it would sound like. And that is the end of the chapter. I'm surprised the two chapters in, we're kind of still in the nursery. It's the opposite of Alice and Alice's adventures. Yeah. It was, she was like... Two sentences in, she was down the Break hole. Right down the hole, yeah. Didn't know who Alice's dad is. No. I feel like I've lived with... Just knew she had a sister and a cat. I feel like I've lived with Mr. Darling for like 10 years and yeah. want to move out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the words of Dustin Hoffman, bring me Peter Pan. Like, it's the title of the book. Oh. And he's been in it the least. Yeah. Too but... much dad. It's too much dad. It's too much dad, too much darlings. From where I'm standing, this is the, uh, this is the bit with the Dursleys before Harry goes to Hogwarts. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and no, then right. all the excitement happens, doesn't it? But it's quite an interesting framing for this chapter. In that it's them in the present, looking back on the past, and it, and we sort of slowly figure out, yeah, that that it's that it's from our children have been kidnapped or they've gone missing, yeah, and they're retelling this story. So there's something really quite, even though we know we're laughing along with the medicine stuff and the dog, whatever, whatever, we then sort of know it's all framed within. We're reliving this story and Build we up. feel guilty and we're overanalyzing everything that happened and what was the last yeah. thing I said to him and what was the last thing I said to her. So it's quite interesting. If we did like a, a BBC adaptation of it, we're flicking between the present back in London. Like two chapters later, the police are there. Yeah, it's exactly. like they're cordoned off the garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like... Nat has given a statement and they're taking paw prints. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm looking at lit charts again. Lit, lit charts! Chart, which I realise isn't street. It just, it just, I think it stands for literature. This kind of just occurred to me that it's not quite as street and cool as I probably thought it was initially. And one of the sections here just talks about Mr. Darling and his behaviour. And it says, though Mr. Darling is balding, financially savvy, savvy and a father of three, he sometimes has trouble acting properly adult he is often silly and he doubts that his family respects him as an adult he is meant to be extremely honorable and brave braver than toddler michael but his aversion to foul tasting medicine is identical to michael's he is supposed to pretend otherwise but he can't manage it he and the children both dislike watching the child adult distinction break down which is true, because, I mean, as a child, you kind of want your dad to be your dad yeah not to kind of and i think the whole thing is even though it is kind of good as an adult to kind of like admit that you do sometimes get scared and show your kids that, you know, it's okay to be scared, but to face those fears. Mm. But when you just act like a petulant child, it just, yeah. makes you, it just completely undermines you as like an authority figure. Is Peter Pan going to fill this male figure role in their lives? Cause he's, is, is, mm, is, is, yeah. that, what is that what it's going to be counter? Cause he's going to be adventurous, brave, teach them morals yeah because i mean at the end of the day mr darling is putting an expectation on michael that he doesn't expect from himself he's he's putting a thing on michael going i expect you to take this medicine yet i'm not going to behave it just makes him a hypocrite but it's a it's a classic uh, sort of do as uh, i say not as i do exactly that kind yeah. of older parenting model yeah but you're just going to end up just thinking your dad's an idiot so where do you think this is going to go on the next chapter? What's, what's, the, what's the title of the next chapter? So chapter three is called Come Away, Come Away. So we might actually be going somewhere now. I, I feel Hopefully. like that's go where away. we're headed. Yeah. 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 Maybe they might actually make it to Netherland. If it starts with, we're, we're with Mr. Darling and he's, he's on his way to work, I'm leaving. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Darling awoke with a fright. His, he chose the red tie and put it on his neck. I forgot his <laughs> coffee because Wendy needed braces or something. <laughs> if you've got any um, opinions or insight about this chapter, you can message us on thelazybookclub at gmail.com. 
Or do a tweet tweet on Twitter at Lazy Book Club Pod. Or do a gram gram. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. Instagram at Lazy Book Club Pod. We do enjoy seeing your messages. Um, so please do keep them coming in. Um, and we also really do appreciate you guys recommending us to other people. We do see them when they pop up on social media. So please do keep up the good work so that we can build the audience for this thing. Woo! So next week, come away, come away. Correct. We'll see you there. <laughs>